welcome to the 14th episode of season 4 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Tuesday the 30th of August 2011 and in this episode we're going to talk to Matt Ravel and Jonathan Lang. We will of course cover the latest news, events, bit about Ubuntu and go over your feedback. I'm Laura, with me this week are Tony, Hello. Mark Hello. and guest presenter Andy Piper. Hiya! Hiya! <laughs> is Andy a stunt Alan this week? He is, yes, because okay. Alan is indisposed. Yes, conveniently has the same first initial, which helps. He does. And the and same second, last initial. Second initial as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Too mm. freaky. So, Andy, <laughs> what have you been doing? Uh, I have been experiencing life after Og Camp. Oh, it's hard. Um, it has been hard. <laughs> Did it you catch the dreaded Og flu? I, I managed to avoid the Og uh, or camp flu, <laughs> that apparently uh, Tony still has. Which, uh, yes, appears to have swept uh, through the attendees. Um, no, um, so what have I done? I've, I've been trying to, trying to help curate the, the lanyard page where we're kind of trying to um, aggregate together all the content. So we've got um, most of the videos. I think I don't want to speak for um, the uh, video team but because uh, I know that they've had um, some, some issues getting th- things uploaded just because everything was recorded in HD. So it's just taken a while to get them all edited and, and uploaded so they're still i believe uploading but um if they're not all there yet they'll be there soon um, they've done a cracking job they've so done well a done super job. yeah thanks really for that and um we've also got uh, various other things like write-ups and everything so if you go to the lanyard page you can basically kind of dive into photos and videos and yeah. blog posts that were written uh, around the event which i think is quite cool um and the other thing i've done yesterday and in fact because i'm taking a week off work this week is i finally built my nanode that I ah, bought as well so is that the bits you won at Ocom? no i i, I Yes, I was one of the winners in the raffle. Um, I, won, <laughs> I won. I won the. Uh, I won the chip kit uh, Max Thirty Two, oh, which yeah. I've unboxed and peered at. <laughs> I have done. Haven't done anything with yet. Prodded um, with your fingertip. Yeah. No. Yesterday was a day with a soldering iron, which. Um, yeah, so I built my nanode, which was good, Ooh. and it works. Um, I haven't Excellent. done anything exciting with it yet, but I'm sure MQTT stuff will happen soon. Mm. <laughs> Brilliant. Happy days, Tony. Um, I have been doing a couple of things recently. One of them is trying to make um, a PDF form using Linux and open source software. Um, mm. You know, you get like PDFs that you can type bo- into yeah. boxes on them and then send them back, save them yeah. and send them back. Yeah. Apparently you can't really make those with Linux very easily. Although if you know of a way and you're listening in <laughs> and you think, oh yeah, of course you can do this, that, the other, uh, please let me know. <laughs> Apparently Sc- Scribus might be able to do it, but um, I was trying to use Inkscape originally and uh, yeah, I've made a nice PDF, but yeah. I can't make an editable one. So, yeah, if you've got any tips and tricks, please let me know. Podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. Um, <laughs> I've also been, post camp, having been sort of inspired by uh, Lorna Jane and some of the other activities, I've been looking at uh, becoming an, a member of Ubuntu. I've never actually done it, despite all the years I've spent, you know, helping out Ubuntu and sending it stands at expos and doing this show. I've never actually become a member yet. So I've been updating my Ubuntu wiki page as a precursor to becoming a member or applying for membership, um, which is at wiki.ubuntu.com slash Tony Whitmore. Quick pimp. Quick pimp. And you can go along there and you can add any testimonials if you feel the need. Uh, <laughs> feel no, I wouldn't bother with that sort of thing. Particularly rubbish. touched or oh. moved by the things that I've done for you. Um, <laughs> uh, a bit seedy. I'm particularly impressed. <laughs> I, you know, he, he has built a fantastic script for automating uh, audio stings in podcasts. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yes. Which contributes to Ubuntu specifically somehow. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going through that process. So uh, that's going to be quite interesting to follow, hopefully, over yeah. the next few episodes. Mm. Cool. Mark, what have you been up to? Uh, I've been making and editing screencasts partially on Linux. (laughs) Partially on Linux. Uh, Uh, And partially on... uh, Another operating system. uh, OS 2? Oh yeah, OS 2. That's right. The the successor to OS 2. OS 3, you might call it. (laughs) Web OS, perhaps. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I was doing the recording on Windows simply because I didn't have a lot of time to faff around and there was a very easy to use open source i might add tool for recording screencasts on cool windows which just worked so i used that but then i did all of the video editing and putting in subtitles and stuff on um linux using kd and live which worked really well and considering mm. i've never vi- edited video before in my life it was very easy to use cool so uh that was good and i've also bought a game from the ubuntu software center which Ooh. is which one? Uh, you bought one. I bought one oh with money. Wow. wow. Uh, that was Braid, the oh, platform yes. time to do with hair. travel. <laughs> no. I've got Braid, actually, on a, on a non-open source platform, um, but it's a good game. It's quite, quite fun. It is a really good game. Yeah, it was in the um, one of the Humble Indie bundles, but I um, have a habit of missing the boat on those. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, it's uh, available for about 
six or seven quid from the Ubuntu Software Center. So cool. yeah, cool. and the whole Checking process of, oh, of buying it, downloading it, installing it, it was really nice. And I mean, it was basically click buy once you've logged into your um, launchpad that's, account. That's what we need. Ease of use, in just, yeah. what, separating how, you from your money. How does the payment system work? Um, Not having bought anything on there. You yet. log into your account using Launchpad single sign-on and enter your card details. Okay, so say, it's, a, it's, me money, not, please. it's not a PayPal or an Amazon or no. Google payment system, no. right? Okay. Sorry. Laura, what about you? Uh, I finally, finally uh, upgraded to Natty on this laptop. Ooh. Ooh. So I've been using Unity. Did it work? Yes, it all worked. Do you like Unity? Uh, yeah, I'm all right with it, actually. Um, I've been playing around with Inkscape as well, so I've been learning how to use that. Oh, cool. Um, and uh, so I've been, like creating something in the last couple of days um, in Inkscape, but having to switch around between applications. And it's probably no better or worse than it was before. So. Fair enough. <laughs> but it looks pretty. I like it. I'm happy enough. Cool. Yeah, it looks pretty. The content is, you know. Separate. Well, it's not vastly different, to be fair. <laughs> fair enough. Okay. Well, let's get on with the show. On the line now is Matt Ravel, I hope. Hello, Matt. Hello there. <laughs> Hello. It, it worked. worked. We didn't lose him. All right. Awesome. Excellent. How are you doing, sir? Very well, thank you. How are you all? Not yeah, too very bad. Well. Not too bad. Now, you're celebrating a bit because you've got a new job, haven't you? I have, yes. yes. T- tell us all about. Okay, well, I'm, I'm now Launchpad Product Manager. I'm taking over from John O'Lang, who I believe is appearing later in the show. I'm glad you got the billing right there. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> and uh, Basically, I'm uh, now in charge, I guess, of the direction for Launchpad and uh, deciding what goes into it. And uh, my word, that's quite an exciting and uh, daunting job. Yeah. So have you officially started now? Yes. um, uh, Yes, I started about a a week ago as of now when we're recording this. So, yeah. Cool. So whenever I hear the word, um, things like deciding on direction, I always... Flashback to a Blackadder sketch where he says, uh, you know, our battles are directed, sir. <laughs> so is there, is there a grand plan behind the launch plan uh, uh, product uh, roadmap? Yes. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's something that I'm, I'm working on now. So it really is a continuation of what um, the, the, the roadmap that uh, John O'Lang uh, set. Um, but so over the next, say, um, let's say year or so, but also we'll, we'll be focusing increasingly on um, fixing those problems that annoy people. Um, so um, one of the things that we've had to do over the past year or two, in fact two years, has been to make bring Launchpad to um, a stage where the performance of it isn't just plainly embarrassing. Um, <laughs> so now it, it, it's, it's wonderful because previously we, the, the first thing people would say to us is, is, is Launchpad is too slow. Okay. And uh, Rob Collins, our technical architect, led a, an effort to make Launchpad perform in a way that you'd expect a, a modern uh, web application to perform. Um, so we've got um, the, the page load times right down so that it's responsive and, and pleasant to use. Um, so now people are starting to talk about other things that, are, that they feel aren't quite right with Launchpad. Um, and so we have, we have a number of uh, usability problems, um, I'd say. Um, so... We're going to address those, but you know, on, on a more positive note, we're going to we're going to have new features to Launchpad. So one thing that we've been talking about, and I don't know if this will actually make it in this year, but one of the things we've been talking about is uh, dare I say, Git support. Um, right. And yeah, so uh, one one of the things I was very keen to do was to make sure that um, Launchpad would get native native Git support. So you can now import a branch into Launchpad from Git to Bazaar. Uh-huh. Um, the one thing that we've been talking about is uh, making it so that Git becomes almost like a you know first class citizen within the launchpad mm. world, um, what, while Bizarre stays there. And because personally, I prefer Bizarre. I know a lot of people do, and Bizarre is a, a wonderful version control system. But there's no getting away from the fact that a lot of a lot of projects want to use Git, so that's something that we're considering doing. Um, also, things like um, adding um, functionality to track the QA status of um, a bug, for example, you know, whether it's been tested or not, um, which, which sounds like a, a small deal, but um, we want to do it without adding yet more bug statuses to Launchpad. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's something that we're, we're, we're talking about and planning. Um, so, so the general idea is, is I suppose, to 
um, the general idea behind the next one, two, three years of Launchpad is that we, we're going to um, make it a much more streamlined experience to use. And also we're going to basically take the fight out there. You know, we want to show that Launchpad is, is here to be the, the home of a vibrant, exciting software development ecosystem around Ubuntu. And to do that, it needs to be, you know, Launchpad needs to be a joy to use. It needs to be um, something that that you can happily recommend people who aren't necessarily that familiar with open source development to use. Um, you know, so that there are people out there who um, develop uh, mobile applications and would would say, well, you know, I, I don't actually like developing, I don't like programming, but I do want to create this thing. Um, and if we're going to get people like that um, to develop the software for Launchpad, then sorry for Ubuntu, then the, the tools that we use need to be really simple, really powerful, without overcomplicating things. Um, so yeah, basically the, the roadmap is simplicity, usability, and really exciting new functionality. Sounds good. Are there particular uh, plans to try and embrace mobile developers in particular and anything like uh, having a launch pad app on Android or iPhone, for example? Um, I can't see that happening straight away. There are a lot more things that we want to do simply with the the, the, the web interface, the web app itself. That's not to say that it, you know anyone is uh, prevented from uh, submitting a, a, a lovely branch that with... Um, you know, either, either a, a, a mobile interface or, or, you know, using the API on Launchpad to um, create an Android or iPhone or whatever app. Um, but that's not something I think we'll be working on straight away um, because there's so much more that we want to do to the core application itself. Um, although, you know, things change. So um, it's, it's easy to say now what the world will look like in three years' time, but who knows? My experience of Launchpad is as a bug raiser, and that's pretty much it, I think. Right. Um, and I know, as you say, there's the sort of development projects. Who is that basically covering your main user audience, or are there other areas that I just haven't seen? So um, the, the people who use Launchpad are quite quite varied, but, but mostly mm. it's it's people who are who are making free software, whether that's through reporting and, and triaging bugs or, or submitting code or um, translating stuff. But we also got answers.launchpad.net, which we just pretty well used. And I'd say it's probably the only place where Launchpad really targets um, people who are primarily end users of software rather than developers. Um, but then, of course, like the, the translations side of things attracts a lot of people who are very much just interested in, in using software, but using it in their own language. So they've taken the time to, to learn how to, to translate that software. And obviously Launchpad makes it quite easy because it's just a simple web interface where you see an English string and then you type in whatever it is in your language. Um, so, yeah, primarily it's, it's for people who are at least comfortable with the ideas behind open source development rather than people who are necessarily, you know, hardcore hackers. Yeah. So it's quite a challenge, I guess, to make everybody happy with the usability of it. Yeah, um, there's, but there's there's kind of, I suppose, a holy grail for usability where you um, where people who who are well, I, I don't want to teach you know grammar to cakes, but you know people who are um, <laughs> beginners can can easily get into it. But basically, I think the the main aim, at least the the, the way that we're going to take it, is that we want to make people who have like an intermediate level of, of knowledge of Launchpad can always be productive and feel comfortable yeah. and without putting off experts and without making beginners feel stupid. And I think that's one of the problems we've got at the moment is there's quite a, a steep learning curve to Launchpad, you know. Mm. Um, mm. Launchpad is, is fantastically powerful. I mean, there's so many wonderful things that it can do. Um, but may, maybe we can make it slightly easier to, to get started in Launchpad. Um, does that figure with the integration of the Ubuntu desktop as well? Because um, the re report buddy, uh, sorry, not report buddy, the report bug tools um, and the things that are within the desktop environment obviously are most people's first interface with Launchpad in mm. a way. Mm. Well, I mean, the, the, uh, the, the Apple report bugs tool isn't something that, that we look after directly in the Launchpad team, but it's obviously, it's, you know, like you say, it is an experience of Launchpad. Um, 
So um, it's something that, I mean, <laughs> reporting bugs for, for something like Ubuntu is, is difficult, obviously, because um, it's so widely used and, and you have a, a, a good bug is, is a hard thing to find, you know, a good bug report where it, it really helps you to, to identify the problem. So um, I, I'd be very, very happy to, to, to you know, to work with the, the Ubuntu platform team and, and that to, uh, to, to to work on the Apple tool. And, and that. Um, but really, I suppose my main interest is, is at the moment in, in, in making the tools that, that enable things like the Apple tool to work, um, such as, you know, basically the, the API and, and the web interface. Do you sort of go out of your way to advocate the use of Launchpad for open source projects, um, or do you just sort of follow the, or will you be following the, the build it and they will come model? Um, a bit of both. Um, I, I think we should we should be much more vocal and much more opinionated um, about how great Launchpad is, um, uh, particularly as we, we continue to um, make it easy to get into Launchpad. Um, uh, so we 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 do want to see as many external open source projects as possible on Launchpad, um, no doubt about it, because the more projects that are on there, um, you know, the, the well, we believe that Launchpad is a really great place to develop open source software. So um, if you've got a free software project and you want to, um, you know, have it translated into many languages without, with very little effort, or you want to make it possible to, for for people to, to share and, and access and contribute code and all that sort of thing, um, then Launchpad is, is ideal. So we, and we, we, we believe very much in free software, obviously. So, you know, and we believe that Launchpad is a great way of building free software. So yes, we want to get free software projects on there, but also to get the side benefit that it, um, if a free software project is on Launchpad, then clearly it's easier for them to get into Ubuntu. Um, mm. So that makes Ubuntu better. And um, so, yes, partly we'll be um, doing more and more of the um, giving people reasons to switch to Launchpad. And um, uh, I, I guess, yeah, going out and, and actively seeking um, uh, to, to get people to switch to Launchpad, yeah. So, so how easy do you think it is for people to get involved with uh, a Launchpad development process? I mean, it, it, it strikes me it's a very rich um, set of capabilities. Mm. And, and you're looking, you know, to, to take it forward and, and improve its user usability and so on. Um, is that something that you um, at Can and Canonical actively kind of um, welcome people to get involved with? Um, I'm guessing, you know, you've just highlighted the, the open source nature of of the platform. Um, uh, presumably, you're 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 you are making it kind of an open um, project, and you you want to help people come on board with that side of things as well, as well as obviously helping people to use it. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, we we are an open source project. We've got a free software license, um, and we very very much welcome contributions. And one thing that we're working on, you know, a few months from the architectural side of Launchpad, is making it easier to start getting to to work on Launchpad, to hack on Launchpad itself. Um, so you know, we we do have a number of developers um, who who contribute um, branches, and that's great. Um, but we want more and more people to get involved. Um, uh, there's only so much that we on the Launchpad team can do. Um, you know, it's about 20 of us on the canonical Launchpad team. Um, so, yeah, we very, very much welcome external contributors. Um, once you've got the Launchpad environment set up on your machine, um, it's, it's, it's relatively easy to, to get stuck in and start hacking. And one thing I will say is that the canonical Launchpad team um, in hash launchpad-dev on Freenode are very, very helpful, very welcoming to new contributors and will take you by the hand and lead you through our development process, which is actually pretty, you know, simple. Um, we've got some coding standards and so on, as, as you'd expect. But, um, you know, really just submit a branch, most proposal, get it, well, get it reviewed by someone on the Launchpad team. And, uh, you know, if it, if it all goes okay, um, we'll land it. Um, so, yeah, we, we, we want to make it easier to get Launchpad, a local Launchpad development environment set up. Um, but once you've got past that slight bump, um, it is it is relatively easy to, to hack on Launchpad. You know, I'm not a, a developer by any means, um, but I I've submitted branches to Launchpad, and you know, small bits of my work are in there. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's not too bad. So, are there um, what what sort of contributions are you looking for to Launchpad as a project in itself? Is it just sort of code and new features, or is there more sort of all encompassing? 
stuff that people can get involved if, in if perhaps they're like you, know, not so much of a developer? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so on, on the code side, we're looking for people who um, either, you know, if they just want to take a bug and fix it, then great. Mm-hmm. Or if they've got a particular... Um, if they've got a particular feature that they'd like to see um, on Launchpad, then we'd invite them to um, to submit a proposal. Uh, I mean, obviously, if they want to go straight ahead and yeah. start, um, if they want to go straight ahead and you know, start coding, then mm-hmm. fine. But it's probably m- more fruitful if, if they go through kind of a proposal process with us. And we've got this thing called the Launchpad Enhancement Proposal Process, um, mm-hmm. which you can find at dev.launchpad.net slash launchpad enhancement proposal process and <laughs> that is really just uh, you know you, you just describe what you need to do to get this feature ready to code mm. as quickly as possible um, so it's, it's fairly straightforward really but you just kind of give a, a, a bit of background to the feature that you're proposing so yeah that, that's on the, the feature side of things in terms of other things absolutely we're definitely looking for people who want to help contribute no, so if it's um so like one of my passions is you know usability and 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 making Launchpad really easy to use. So um, one thing that I'm doing over the next few months is basically cataloging all the usability issues in Launchpad. You know where we could just make Launchpad that bit more joyous to use. Um, so very much interested in having people either report bugs on that or um, if they want to um, you know go go through a, a deeper sort of you know get involved in our user research. Um, and um, that sort of thing, that that would be very welcome. Um, also, if people want to help us um, do documentation or, or blog about Launchpad or, you know, produce screencasts, you mentioned screencast production in, 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 the, uh, in the intro. I'm, I've produced a number of screencasts purely on, on Ubuntu. Um, yeah, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what, showing what Launchpad can do. And uh, we need more and more of that. And actually... I'm. Uh, I think I'm allowed to say that I'm about to um, start recruiting for someone to join the Launchpad team, who can um, help us out with um, both user research and uh, communication side of things. Hmm. So uh, yeah, watch this space. Sort of thing. So that presumably will be on Chronicle's website, I guess. Yes, it will go on the usual uh, place, but also I'll tweet about it and post links to to uh, to the job ad. Excellent. Brilliant. So where can people find you, Matt? Uh, well, I'm on. Uh, Twitter as Matthew Ravel, all one word, that's R E V E L L, or you can email me matthew.ravel at canonical.com. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much indeed for coming on the show and talking to us. Best oh, of luck me. with your new role. Cheers. And um, I'm sure we will all see Launchpad becoming joyous in the future. Yeah. I, I bet you will. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good evening. You. Cheers then, Matt. Cheers. See ya. Bye. And now it's time for the news. Hooray. <laughs> Linux kernel maintainer Greg Crow Hartman has suggested that a stable release of the kernel should be selected each year as a long-term release, being supported for two years. This will allow distributors and device manufacturers alike to standardise on the supported kernel version for their product's lifespan. Sounds rather like what Ubuntu do with their long-term support releases. Yes, it sounds a lot like that. Mm. And what people are saying that Firefox should be doing and... Yeah. yeah. All, but, all that's but then kind of jazz. People are saying that Chrome shouldn't be doing, for example. So, you know, or Chrome is not following that. We've already said it's following a much more rapid release cycle. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing here is uh, it's, it's, it's new Linux and a bunch of other stuff, right? So, mm-hmm. so the kernel's important. But it, you know, it, it is, but we're particularly particularly important devices. for devices and external um, uh, software applications. VMware, for example, is an obvious one which compiles modules and things that have to link into into particular versions of the kernels. Mm. Um, uh, it makes sort of sense to me. Mm. Be interesting to see if anybody actually um, adopts that if they are a long term release distributor if you see what I mean well it sounds like the reason this has come about is because people have been sort of doing it anyway yeah so this sort of just sort of makes it a bit more official cool HP has announced discontinuation of WebOS it's a Linux based operating system and the possible spinning out or or selling out of uh 
personal systems group, its hardware division. So this was um, a story that was came on uh, came across everybody's radar a week or two back when yeah. HP decided to uh, potentially move out of the computing space directly and uh, then drop the prices on its touchpads and everybody <laughs> ran off to, uh, to to pick up a £99 touchpad. And Did anyone get Dixons. one? <laughs> I, I've met one person who got one because their son worked for an IDT, uh, 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 sorry, an IT <laughs> sales company. Ah, I see. So got my a, teeth back in. An inside track. Yes. Yeah. But, but most people seem to be buying them in the hope that Android gets ported to the device, which yes. I find, well, I mean, I, I don't doubt that it's possible to do it. Um, yeah. But um, certainly Honeycomb, which is a tablet version of Android, isn't currently fully open source. So you're going to get some kind of gingerbread or something else on there at the moment, I guess. And it's not ideal android hardware because it doesn't have any it only has the one button and a few other bits and pieces but um the, the interesting thing was just as we were about to uh, go to air this evening, <laughs> oh, yeah. breaking news breaking news yeah. uh, on the tech republic blog um there was a story that uh, actually the touchpad may may live on because um although hp is talking about spinning off the pc unit they may continue to uh, produce tablet devices which would make sense if we mm. think that tablets are where Things are going, which of course is what Simon Phipps said at uh, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, the price point if they were selling them off at eighty nine pounds in the UK at one point, yeah, is obviously enough to get people running to it, even an end of life piece of hardware. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the the main resale price was about four hundred quid, and that was obviously enough to let nobody buy them. Mm. So clearly, there's a sweet spot. I would guess around the two hundred pound mark for a reasonably spec tablet, which will get I, enough sales so, to make it sustainable. So, I think I'd buy a tablet for that price. So Chemical I, yeah. Oliver actually in our in our live uh, IRC chat channel which is uh, ubuntu dash uk dash podcast uh, if you're listening to the live stream then uh, pe- people can join in um has commented that he got one and uh, he said for 100 pounds it's good but for 500 it wouldn't be so yeah. uh, you know i think that's exactly the point tony's mm. just made etherpad light a re-implementation of the open source collaborative editor in javascript has made its first stable release along with a few minor feature improvements the new release sports greatly reduced resource usage of the original etherpad yeah, Etherpad was the thing that got bought out by Google to yeah. become allegedly oh, yeah. part of Wave and then got dropped, dropped basically. Well, no, I mean, I oh. think a lot of the, the technology that was in Etherpad and Wave is now very visible in Google Docs. You've yeah. got collaborative editing yeah. and all those kinds sure, of things. Yeah. So I'm sure a lot of that, the same principles have been folded in. But it was also um, open sourced under the Etherpad Foundation and yes. sort of kept going. And that's where Etherpad yeah. lights come out of basically someone's taken... Um, taken it and rewritten it on Node.js, which is a server-side platform for running JavaScript, basically. And it needed doing because, as I understand it, the uh, server-side requirements for running Etherpad were fairly humongous. Yes, because it ran on Java. It yeah. needed a uh, fairly substantial piece of kit to run it, and now it needs about 20 meg of memory. And I think you had to have OpenOffice installed as well, really? even on the server, to, <laughs> for some of the export options to work. Wow. Oh, no. It was all quite heavy well, going. But yeah, I uh, downloaded it and installed it on my HP micro server, and <laughs> yeah. it works like a charm excellent mm, brilliant so we're going to move the show notes to mark's hp microservice no <laughs> yeah on his personal cloud yeah. <laughs> damn right for those of you who are at camp um <laughs> it's been 20 years since the uh, since the announcement of linux by linus torvalds on the comp os minix usenet news group who remembers news groups eh um choice choice quotes from the announcement are that it won't be big and professional like GNE or GNU and it's not portable and will probably never support anything other than AT hard disks (laughs) (laughs) 20 years and it's come a long way quite a long way certainly in the server space and uh, mobile I guess it's really dominant at the moment or at least a significant player but probably not on the desktop 20 years of not being the year (laughs) of the Linux desktop it'll be this year yeah 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 And an event to tell you about, Bar Camp Blackpool is taking place on the 15th of October at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, and they're looking for sponsorship. Yes, we interviewed uh, the lady whose name is temporarily escapes me uh, a couple of episodes ago. Les Pounder sent an interview with her, Gemma Cameron, that's the lady's name, um, who organises Bar Camp Blackpool, and uh, that was a good kind of summary of what goes on there, so go back and listen to that. It was about two or three episodes ago. Um, they're also looking for sponsorship, so if you're a business and interested in sponsoring the the event, um, go to their website, barcampblackpool.com. Com. Dot com. Dot com. Yes, there we go. Hey, how's, how's about that for a bit of guesswork? Um, and you can find out more how I have to get involved as well. Um, there were 150 tickets, so... Um, yeah, they seem, I mean, they seem to have 
over more than doubled their first year in their second year and it's just the coverage of topics sounds really interesting yeah, uh, so cool. yeah so if you've got a ticket go along and uh, let us know how it was And we had a competition in episode 12. It was very exciting. That was the episode before Og Camp. Indeed. Long time in the past now, so it seems. Yeah. And the competition was to win a mini laptop. Who can describe the laptop for me? It's like a really cheap MacBook running Ubuntu. No. (laughs) Rages. Canada's. Well, it's sort of slim form factor, atom-based thin MacBook Air wannabe with a low build quality, but a lot cheaper. Yes. And a Mac-style keyboard, yeah, the wasn't keyboard it? Design, that wasn't And it, yeah. running Ubuntu. Yep. Yeah. So all of those things. Anyway, we set the competition. <laughs> the question was, what is the phone number of Klausoft? And Klausoft are the company who are selling the uh, the Meanies. The answer was on their website, so you had to go there and find out. We had a lot of entries. A staggering <laughs> a number of entries. <laughs> um, Lee said about which, the better. Um, and we have a winner, and the winner is C. Rathbone of Gmail Land. He didn't actually say <laughs> where he's from, so let's hope it's somewhere local. <laughs> and he can come around to Alan's house and pick it up. Oh, or Alan will deliver it by hand, I'm sure. I, uh, with, a, with, a, with a hat and a cheery smile. Maybe yes. we could make him run up lots of stairs. That's it. Hopefully C. Rathbone lives at the top of a big flight of stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Alan distributed all the prizes in the old camper raffle and had to run up and down all day. So hopefully, you know, Mr. Rathbone lives... Or oh, I say Mr. I'm assuming. Hmm, there you go. Uh, Mr. <laughs> or Miss or Ms. or Mrs. Uh, Rathbone lives in Scotland and Alan can run up to Scotland. That would, you know, it's quite high thing. up there. So way. yes, please let us know who you are and where you live so we can send you... <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're going to send you an email as well, but you know, hopefully you'll listen to this. And congratulations on winning the prize. I just realised I didn't get the chance to play my drum roll music. No, I, I, I realised you'd missed that. Go on, it was too do it late. now. Really? Yeah. Otherwise your script won't be queued up. This is true. <laughs> C. Rathbone of Gmail. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Anyway. Right, let's get on with the show. <laughs> We're here with Jonathan Lang from Canonical, who's going to talk about um, getting developers uh, involved in the Ubuntu platform. So, John, hello. Thank you for joining us. Oh, hi. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and do you want to start just telling us a bit about developer.ubuntu.com and uh, what the plan is around that project? Sure, sure. So, um, for a long time, uh, the Ubuntu... Uh, so, Ubuntu is a platform for people to use and to, to write apps for. For a long time, there hasn't really been a central place for an application developer to go to, to if they want to figure out how to write their application for Ubuntu, to get it published on Ubuntu, perhaps to port it from another platform to Ubuntu. There hasn't been a central location for this. Um, and developer.ubuntu.com is going to be that central location, a, sort of a hub where all that information um, can exist. So it's sort of like um, a place for all the documentation to go and sort of folks for discussions, things like that? Yeah, yeah. So um, not just documentation, uh, but um, also, um, you know, web-based tools for actually taking an application you've written and getting it into the software center. Right. So sort of like packaging tools and things like that. Things, sort of like things that you've got in Launchpad, but not necessarily for just um, putting stuff into the repositories, but more sort of general application packaging for Ubuntu. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, the people... Cause because a lot of application developers, a lot of upstream developers, they don't, they don't even want to figure out what a PPA is. They don't. Yeah. They're, they're probably, you know, they could be using, you know, Google Code or whatever to write their application. They just want to get it published in a, in Ubuntu. Like Ubuntu is is a destination for them, not not a journey. Mm. And so they just kind of want to write an app and submit it and get it published. Do you think you'll um, doing this? You'll be able to attract more developers to be putting their um, applications to packages in the Ubuntu repositories. Yeah, we certainly hope so. I, at the moment, um, a lot of us feel that it's a bit it's a bit difficult to to get it get something into Ubuntu at the moment. So we think that by making it a lot easier, um, people will it, yeah will get more applications. 
What do you find are the biggest blockers? So the blockers that people have now are partly that packaging is, is, is quite hard and a little bit esoteric. Um, Ubuntu um, doesn't have anything comparable to the experiences that, say, Android has or iOS has or OS ten or, you know, that no one... There isn't something that looks like developer.android.com. So people just don't know where to go. Um, and also, I think the. I also think that for a lot of people, their motivation is to write commercial applications so that they can mm. get the money back. And there's not really a clear. It's not. I think there's not really a clear path for those people on Ubuntu at the moment, and that's kind of what we're fixing. So I'm looking at developer.ubuntu.com right now, and it looks like at the top level it's kind of split into into four sections, create, develop, collaborate, and publish, and you've talked about um, some of those. I mean, at what stage do you think this um, set of resources is at at the moment? Presumably this is something that's going to evolve and that that more work is needed on in, in different places. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, the, the thing that's up there right now is, is something that um, a few people did in their their time as something that I thought was just uh, really needed to be done. At the moment, there's a team of people working at Canonical who are working to to completely redo the site. A lot of the people, the people behind Ubuntu.com as it stands today, are now working on developer.ubuntu.com. But this isn't so, sorry. This this isn't a, a wiki-like format by the looks of it. Um, so no. this is something that's going to be centrally um, managed or looked after from the Canonical side. Well. Um, yeah, yes, probably. So it's going to what we're what we're really hoping to have is um, uh, so the most of the content will be WordPress powered, and I think what we want to have there is is um, a play, like sort of quite curated content, like places where people can submit stuff, but that there's like some kind of reasonably strong editorial hand to make sure it doesn't become like a wiki because wikis are great but they can often be hard to navigate and like navigation is sort of essential to what makes this a useful website um but we're not expecting i don't think canonical particularly um wants to have like like you know be the master curator controller people like that's you know it's just that i assume that that would be something that um would be more open Right, I mean, I, I can see there's a there's a feedback link as well. So, um, you know, it does seem like a, 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 a it, it feels like it's giving a much more professional feel um, mm. to to the whole experience. Do you think that's really important for attracting new developers? Are they put off by uh, um, wikis or, or or that sort of perhaps a slightly ad hoc style of documentation? Um. So, I personally think that in any um, I, I think it's actually a very general principle that um, outsiders, whatever the inside is, outsiders are often put off by mediocrity. Yeah, I think. Mm. Um, you know, and, and so I think that that you know, like the things that you tolerate when you're on the inside, because you know, it's, it's you know, it's Joe, and we all like Joe, and he did this, and you know, that's great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like to an outsider, it just looks, it just, it just feels alienating and weird. Yeah, um, right. You know, and. You know, this can be true for like a, a wiki or like, you know, um, lady at church who can't play the organ or, or whatever, you know, like there's, <laughs> there's a huge spectrum of, of things there. Yeah. So, I mean, it does look like a nice slick looking mm. site when you land on it even. So. Yeah. Well, we're really hoping to make, well, we're really hoping that, that in a few weeks we'll be releasing like a version that'll be, have way better content and hopefully be just as slick to look at. Cool. So you mentioned uh, before about, um, sort of uh, attracting people who are going to be developing commercial type applications is the main focus of developer.ubuntu.com to attract sort of people who want to sell proprietary software through the Ubuntu software center. Um, no, not really. Um, <laughs> or, or like, yeah, kind of, but like there's some subtlety there. So one is, um, <laughs> enlighten us. <laughs> so one is, um, what we want, full stop, is more apps. Yeah. Like the thing we care about is more apps. That, that's like the main thing we care about. Um, and um, the apps that we, we like the best are commercial apps mm-hmm. and open source apps. Huh. Now, I didn't commercial, so 
um, for example, someone uh, has just used uh, the used developer.opens.com and the, the publishing system behind it to publish um, Photobomb, you know, uh, which is uh, Rick Spencer wrote that. He's selling that for five bucks a copy or something like that. Um, but it's an open source application. It's GPL3, mm -hmm. he's, but he's using that to sell it on the software server. Yeah. Um, okay. Similarly, um, the application review board, which is um, Ubuntu's uh, governance system for getting new apps into a stable release of Ubuntu, they're going to uh, move over to using developer.ubuntu.com to use that as a way for people to submit new open source apps into the stable release of Ubuntu. Right. Um, yeah. So, so it's all going to go through the same channel now, basically. Yeah, it is. I mean, like Canonical will be will be packaging apps for people who are you know for commercial yeah. people because that that's basically it. it's a way for us to make money. Mm. And, you know, and not so much on the on the on the free open source apps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so will it be, will developerubuntu.com be a useful resource for people who are just doing you know, bog standard uh, open source you know, apps or, or will they still get it into Ubuntu through the, the usual routes of approval through the Motu or, or, or through Debian? Um, so I think for the, for the publishing side of it, I think, I think that's something we'll, we'll see over the course of, over the next, of the next year. Like, uh, it, it might be that people prefer prefer to use developers on Ubuntu.com or I'm, I'm just not sure how that works out but it's, there's a lot of stuff there. On the content side, um, I'm really hoping that um, what, we, what we can put up on developers on Ubuntu.com uh, for example, just a recommended, recommended ways of writing desktop apps or you know, some good solid documentation of like an overview of what, how Ubuntu is structured as a platform or what APIs you can think of when you're thinking of Ubuntu. So that would include, um, I mean, probably GNOME things and Unity things and stuff like that, and up, you know, upstart, that whole, you know, trying to, trying to you, know, gen, you know, people who write code day in, day out, like, what is Ubuntu from the point of view of, you know, my, my next line of Python code? Trying to give a sense of a house style almost and encourage people to use it. Yeah, maybe, yeah. So... Uh um, Sorry, is there is there a risk there that you know people who would generally be developing open source apps would then end up writing stuff in a way that would work you know really well under Ubuntu on Unity, but then perhaps wouldn't work so well under uh, perhaps other Linux distributions? Or maybe is that the point? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so like we're not we're not like maliciously trying to write documentation to sabotage yeah. <laughs> other, other right? But, um, but Ubuntu, is the one we, Ubuntu is the one we care about the most. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, this is a personal opinion and, and not a canonical opinion, that um, <laughs> like, when people think Linux desktop these days, they generally do think Ubuntu. Mm. And, yeah. and I think for a lot of people, that, that's kind of synonymous. I mean, um, in... There's also this other big issue, which is that um, one of the huge differences between Linux and OS X, say, is that um, OS X and Apple stuff is a very t tightly controlled stack with very few choices as to technologies all the way up or down. Mm -hmm. Like there's, always, there's almost always one clear best technology at yeah. every level of the stack. The thing that makes Linux so wonderful and at the same time so often so frustrating is that there's a million choices. Mm -hmm. yeah. like we, do, we don't even have we don't have one desktop environment. You know, we don't we don't even have one GNOME desktop environment. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, people publish KDE variants and you know, like all this sort of stuff. So, um, have that's a nightmare to document. And if you're new, it's it's not a you kind of don't want to have to make a decision like that. Mm. Yeah. Um, so what we're hoping to do is is just is pick something to start with, yeah, and help people get you know get in, get their feet wet, get things going, and then hopefully maybe empower them to make a choice once they you know once they've done that. You mm. know, that's that's kind of what we're aiming for. But the, the challenges of actually of the information architecture, as as the, as the designers call it, is 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 pretty significant there. Mm. 
speaking of giving people a chance to get their feet wet, you're also involved in a tool called Puckage Me. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not sure I said that correctly, but um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about that. Cool. So um, Package Me, which is uh, is a tool that uh, James Westby, um, uh, uh, who works at Canonical, uh, wrote. And the idea of Package Me is that you have your, your application that you've just written. Um, doesn't matter what you've written it in, doesn't matter what language. Um, and then you're in the top level of your, your source code checkout, and you run Package Me, and it creates a fully working uh, Ubuntu package for you. Wow. And, um, a bit like check install. Pardon? A bit like check install. I'm not familiar with that one, actually. It a, does a similar thing, sorts of takes some source code, instead of running make install, just builds a Debian package for you. Ah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it does, it, it's something, uh, yeah, something like that, except this, it doesn't care. I mean, the goal is that it won't care whether you've written a Python code, written mm. Python app or a Ruby app or, you know, um, an HTML5 app or whatever. And, um, It'll build a package and upload it to to, to a PPA if you're choosing. Oh, brilliant. And yeah, so all you have to do is actually oh, yeah. just type in those five letters, package me, and it'll build a source package for you right on your desktop. Does it do like dependency things like that? Yep. Um, yep. It, so it, it it itself is a very simple system. It just it it has a pluggable backends, and then you people write backends for. Um, say, for example, that James Ward wrote a Python backend, which looks at the setup.py file, which practically every Python developer would, would have in their thing, mm -hmm. and then oh. loads, reads the dependencies from there, All right. cool. translates them from the names of the Python packages to the names of the, you know, the, the Debian style names mm. for, the, for the packages there, and does that. But presumably, you can have the license file from the copyright there, and all that, all sorts of things. But presumably it needs at least some user input beyond package me, right? It, you've got to give it some metadata about the package that you're building and the title and what it does and so on? Um, no, uh, it, it tries to guess it so that you don't have to do that. All right. So yeah. we'll take that from like um, inline documentation, things like that, or in readme files? Um, well, in the Python example, for example, yeah. it would take it from um, the, the Python, the top level Python package. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah. So um, presu presumably you have to write a backend for each language you want to support. Yes, indeed. And right. um, the backend that I've just written that I've been focused on most recently isn't even for, for um, it, it is a backend for when you don't have the code. So it's a backend for when all you've been given is is a, a table of a binary and it tries to figure it out. Um, it makes a package assuming that it's a C application and figures out the dependencies from the symbol files mm -hmm. and assumes that it's going to run in opt, um, that sort of thing. So is the idea of this to get people over the hump of having their application in a distributable form? Yeah, the idea of this is to the, in fact, the idea of the, this is to make sure that people don't feel the hump at all. Um, right. Is, is to yeah. Okay. So where can people find out more about the uh, developer Ubuntu dot com and the uh, Package Me project? So um, Package Me, you can find out about. Um, by going to uh, launchpad.net slash package me, P-K-G-M-E. Um, the developer.ubuntu.com work, uh, you can find out about uh, probably the best place at the moment is uh, it's a bit rough, is wikiubuntu.com slash app developers, capital A, capital B. Okay, and if people want to uh, get in touch with you online, can they find you on Twitter or something like that? Um, you can find me on Twitter where my, um, where my ID is mumak, M-U-M-A-K. And uh, I'm JML on Freenode, and, I've, and I'm always happy to be pinged. You can find me in, in lots of different channels. Um, if you're interested, you're probably already on one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, well, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, so thanks very much for coming on the show. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, we look forward to seeing what comes out of uh, your projects. Oh, me too. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> Jonathan. Thanks. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye. It's time for Gerald, or the bit about Ubuntu. <laughs> yes, well corrected. I'm sure Pope will be happy with me anyway. Uh, so yeah. the Ubuntu UK Loco team were reapproved at the recent Loco Council meeting. Right. Yeah, I believe that this means another two glorious years of UUPC. 
I, I don't think there's a direct correlation. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, locos have to be reapproved. I think it's every two years um, to make sure they're still valid and up and running and that approval on message <laughs> <laughs> that they're drinking the Kool-Aid. Yeah. I um, think we just borrow the name, don't we? We have a permission to use the name. The Ubuntu name, yes. yes. Well, yeah, but we're sort of, you know, part of the UK loco. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so the UK loco got approved, which means they get access to, th- reapproved, which means they get access to things like conference packs, um, uh, where they can get shipped lots of CDs to take to various events and give them out. And obviously the whole uh, uh, meeting agenda and uh, minutes are on the Ubuntu wiki. So if people want to go and see what was discussed on the IRC meeting, then they can do so. Yeah, I mean, the UK team is one of the more active ones anyway. Um, so it probably was... I don't want to say a foregone conclusion, but it was it, it was it seemed fairly uh, obvious that it was going to get reapproved. It was certainly a unanimous vote from what I what I read. Yeah, yeah, but it's good to see. So well done, everybody, and you can um, carry on. Um, there's also a piece of news <laughs> in other voting news. <laughs> <laughs> the Ubuntu UK podcast's uh, very own Dave Walker, presenter from uh, seasons one through to three, um, is standing for the um, developer membership board. Sorry, that's quite hard to say. Um, <laughs> which is responsible for reviewing and approving new Ubuntu developers. So separate from the membership board, which is the standard Ubuntu membership. Which this he's is already, isn't he? Yeah, but he's standing for the board. Uh, so the board will decide who gets to become an official Ubuntu developer. Um, and uh, therefore, then, um, they get a developer privilege. So they can do things like commit packages into oh. Universe and things like that. So... Um, he's all, he's already a developer, and in fact, developers can be nominated um, and can vote on the uh, on the positions. There are four candidates: uh, Stefan, Stefano Rivera, Dave Walker, Mika Gertsen, and Charlie Smotherman. Um, and obviously, you know, um, we're not going to be biased. We're not going to try and suggest <laughs> you should vote for one person over another. But um, the voting closes at uh, midday UTC um, on the sixth of September. So if you're interested in taking part in that, you can... Uh, and if you're an Ubuntu developer and have voting rights. Yes, you will, have been t- <laughs> you will have been told if you have voting rights on this. So just a friendly reminder that you might want to use them. Um, but yeah, <laughs> good luck, Dave. Canonical has published a free ebook touting the merits of Ubuntu for enterprise customers looking to upgrade from Windows XP. Yes, yes which uh, you have to give them all your information, details, yes. personal life and back history to the, access i believe can't you just make it up you can just make it up and then it does it doesn't even email it to the email address you give them it just gives you a download link oh okay oh. Yeah, <laughs> excellent i yeah. should pretend to be uh bill gates so they're taking advantage of um, windows xp finally going out of service yeah that's basically it they're um, like showing what the cost would be of upgrading to or upgrading yeah. existing hardware to windows 7 or replacing existing hardware with hardware running windows 7 and the benefits that Ubuntu will give you and how it's ready for the year of the, the Linux desktop. <laughs> it says you and can so. download it and discover the cost of a Windows 7 upgrade for your organization. Seven trends changing your desktop strategy. Anybody fallen asleep yet? Four types of users who don't who just don't need Windows. Eight reasons why Ubuntu is enterprise ready. Four experience of enterprises now using Ubuntu and the risk-free way to try out Ubuntu today. So it's sort of like the opposite of that video Microsoft did on why you shouldn't use OpenOffice. But in book yes. form. But backwards. Yes. And about Ubuntu. Yes. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, interesting <laughs> interesting new tactic. I don't think we've really seen people try and launch a an ebook in Ubuntu. <laughs> no, they've <laughs> marketed Ubuntu. They've done the billboards and things like that. But I think... This seems like a very corporate, mm, uh, yeah, targeted yeah. thing. The sort of thing I expect to get spammed about in my e- inbox anyway at work. Mm. Um, so that's the audience they're going for, isn't that is it? That is the audience they're going corporate. for, yeah. I wouldn't be surprised to see it landing in there if I didn't have to sign up for it. <laughs> uh, and Canonical have announced that Ubuntu Server 11.10 will be supported on the low-power ARM processor architecture and that support will be ongoing for the 12.04 long-term support release. Yeah. Is anybody excited about having uh, ARM support for a server release? It means that you can run it on things like my Guru plug. Uh, so, yeah, so okay. actually, that is a good good point. So you're excited about well, it. I'm personally excited. Well, certainly ARM is oh, becoming yeah. a considerably more popular architecture with yeah. all the low-cost devices and low-power devices that are coming out. So, um, you know, I think it's good that they, they, they're um, supporting it for the server regardless. Um, so the Guru plug's a good example, but um, there are a bunch of others. And, and, you know, um, the fact that they're taking it forward, they're not just kind of trying, yeah, it, out, saying, trying yeah. it out and seeing how it goes. Yeah. 
And on the uh, on the desktop for the LTS release, uh, would you really want an uh, Ubuntu desktop? It's quite a heavy thing these days. It needs a lot, a lot of RAM and a fair bit of CPU. And ARMs aren't, they're low power, but they're not known for their CPU grunt. Mm. Well, they um, hasn't um, the desktop version of Ubuntu already supported ARM for a release or two? I believe that's what I read. It could not well the time I've tried using it. Although um, I don't see the advantage so much in terms of the desktop um, release because I've never actually seen a desktop or laptop machine that I'd want to buy running an ARM chip. The only thing I know that has them is the Chromebook. I'm thinking tablets. Ah, oh, yes. Mm. There is always that. Yeah. Tablets, yeah. what are they? Oh, I talked to them earlier. I don't know. <laughs> Things that don't run WebOS anymore. Yes. Not anymore. Cool. And that's all in the bit about Ubuntu. And now it's time for the feedback. Uh, so James Fox emailed with a proposition. In Ubuntu 11.10, Wake on LAN works only in the first 10 seconds after suspending. I want to try a different way to get it fixed. I'm willing to PayPal someone $15 US if they can figure out the solution. Why $15? For me, that's what it's worth to get this sorted. I figure it t if it takes an hour for someone knowledgeable to solve, well, $15 per hour isn't too bad for work done in one's spare time. So if anyone wants to take up James's offer, email him at jhowardfox at yahoo.com. Yeah, interesting. We're being used as some sort of broking agent. <laughs> <laughs> Completely at your own risk. Uh, get in touch with James. Um, we didn't. We don't, we're not, don't know James. We haven't endorsed him or, or checked him out. Well, hopefully, it's not. I mean, we're not creaming any it, money off the top. If no. it's something that, if that problem is something that requires kernel work, then that might be a bit um, more more than an hour's work. I'm guessing. If it's something that's just you know a scripting type, you know, yeah. in its script type thing, then maybe that's something that, that can be done more easily. Yes. I, I, I mean, I feel I feel James's pain because I, I typically have little problems with things like suspend or hibernate or whatever, mm. which do kind of, they're niggles. They're not things mm. that will mm. fundamentally stop me from using Ubuntu or any Linux on my laptop. But stuff that you don't know, yeah. you don't know the specific enough to, to say, oh, I'll have a poke around here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, fair enough. Um, and Alistair Marshall, sorry, just bear with me. Okay. Alistair Marshall. He... Uh, for, who who spoke at Odd Camp? No, he didn't. Fact. He emailed in. He emailed in at Odd Camp <laughs> about <clears throat> emailed in to let us know. Right. I shouldn't have read that. Sorry, okay. I've really messed this up, haven't I? Okay, Alistair Marshall emailed about this on his sound clip script, which was seen at Odd Camp. Excellent. I used right. to work as part of the tech crew for an improvisation troupe, and we had to quickly find relevant sound clips for their sketches using CDs and mini discs queued up to the correct moments. I wrote a browser-based application, ImpAmp, which turns your computer keyboard into a sound effects keyboard. The GUI shows a keyboard on your screen. Each letter is labelled with an MP3 title. You press a key on your standard computer keyboard or click the letter on the screen to play the sound effect. The code is available on Launchpad, though it's a bit out of date, and as an online demo. It should be easy enough to add your own clips. So, uh, this was the uh, sound... Uh, clip application that I wrote that got a big laugh at Odd Camp. What amazing, <laughs> what, what amazing name does that project have, Tony? It's, it's called Cartwall. Cartwall? Yes. Oh, which is the radio term. There. Yes, indeed. But they used to use mm. carts and they, they used did. to have a wall of them. Mm. Mm. So there's, um, I, I noted that because I've done some podcasting in my time um, and uh, I have a, an, a, an app on my uh, on my Mac actually called Soundboard, which is kind of a GUI for some for similar purposes. You just yeah. basically have a load of buttons which are like a cart wall and you just attach a sound clip to them. So I just wondered whether... Either you and uh, you and the uh, impamp folks could uh, join forces and not duplicate all the effort, or perhaps come <laughs> up with a simple PYGTK well, the amount user of, interface. The amount of effort that's gone into my thing is fairly minimal. Um, I did have but to look. You at said it was a, a masterpiece of engineering. You spent <laughs> hours working over this. Well, yeah, I spent you know an hour, which therefore is worth fifteen dollars. Um, <laughs> I have looked at other soundboard applications, and there are a couple on Linux, but they're mostly Java and don't work. Um, <laughs> but the Impamp demo that uh, that Alistair emailed about does work, and it's pretty good. Cool. And I, I would like to have a bit more time to play with it. So, uh, is there a benefit to having a GUI, not to do with the Impamp, but your Andy's suggestion? Well, I mean, on the yeah. Mac, you know, you are primarily using a graphical user interface. Mm. It's much less console terminal oriented. In 
at all and that's not a bad thing i mean tony's is very simple and easy and it works and does exactly what so you're right i mean is there a user benefit maybe not other than just a more potential. people are going to use it if it's got a gui well it's, it's less it's less um, about that than if you're trying to do something really quickly mm. i can see why impamp is good because you're pressing yeah. all right you have to know the shortcuts maybe but you just press the button whereas if you're trying to target something with a mouse in a hurry that can yeah. be quite messy well, you've got a keyboard shortcut, so you hit the right key, or touch screen, bam, because it's effectively the same as a left click anyway. Yeah. So that's the way I think I'd like to try it out. Anyway. Og Camper Alastair Munro emailed to let us know, Having won O'Reilly vouchers in the Og Camp raffle, I quickly found a Python manual and the Arduino cookbook. When totting out the prices with delivery, it came to more than the value of the vouchers. When I emailed O'Reilly to ask how they would like me to pay the difference, they emailed back to say they'd take the vouchers as full payment and where would I like the book sent to? They sponsor events, they're lovely people, they publish brilliant books and they're generous to a fault. Can you give them a massive mon- monster props <laughs> for being utterly excellent? I think we just did. Monster props. Monster props. <laughs> they do just write the normal books. type. I, I've also got the Arduino cookbook and it's extremely good. So, uh, yeah, yeah, so I do cool. think they write some. And that's a big, I mean, these are both the Python and the Arduino ones are big chunky books. So. Oh, wow. Is anybody else craving Monster Munch now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel Verity emailed to suggest we discuss unity and accessibility in a future episode. There must be lots of people who wonder just how a blind person can use a computer at all. I know when I've played around with screen readers and magnifiers, it's been extremely confusing. It would be very interesting if you could interview someone who is blind and people with other disabilities too, to find out how they do it. It would be a real practical benefit, as there must be plenty of listeners who, like me, develop applications but don't really give any thought to accessibility issues. Yeah. Steve Lee gave a great talk about accessibility at OGCAMP. Yeah, he yes, did. He did. Yes. And um, your video's see. online. Yeah. You can yes. go and have a look. Yeah. I think it's a fair point, though, because I know the first time I tried using a screen reader, I, I kind of knew the the principles of what you were supposed to do to make things accessible to a screen reader. But until you try it, you've really got mm. no idea. And then you've got no idea how a blind person really uses one of yeah. these things. And it's certainly not like how I used no, looking, it. <laughs> looking at a screen and watching it being read out and yeah. actually not knowing what, you know, how things are laid out on yeah. the screen is just completely it's just different. It's speed as well. Yeah. Well, the um, the thing is, that I think, I think um, Nigel's got a, a great, implication around unity and accessibility i think we know that unity is still not done right it's, yeah. it's yeah. midway through it's it's, it's not it's ready cycle. yet <laughs> exactly <laughs> uh and and you know that I'm, I'm sure canonical in fact I'm, I'm i'm sure it was probably on an earlier episode of this very podcast that i heard that um canon- that, that they were aware mm-hmm. of accessibility issues yeah. and the need to improve yeah and um, as a as ever with specific interviewees um if anybody has got um contacts or they know people who might be suitable to come on and talk to about I talk to us on the show about that, then please let us know. Russ Phillips emailed in about web-based readers for Amazon Kindle books. It's arrived to Chrome slash Chromium and Safari. There's no Firefox version yet, but I've tried it on Chromium on Ubuntu 1104 Natty. First impressions are that it works well. Cool. cool. And there's a URL, which I'm sure we will put in the show notes. We will indeed. Uh-huh. Gwed Campbell emailed about our discussion on video production software. I'm no professional, but I found that Sinolara completely meets my needs. You need to spend an hour or more on this Sinolara for Grandma site <laughs> before you ever run the program and then look for tutorials on YouTube. I produce everything from short clips on YouTube to DVDs to give to my friends. I can organise and edit the clips, add transitions, title and credits, and wind up just what I was after. Good stuff. Whenever I tried to use Sinolara, you had to download some statically linked binary from 2004, <laughs> which crashed every time we tried to you run see, it. You see, you didn't follow the Sinolara for grandma link. Did I didn't. You? I've not you heard of that. that. I will check it out. I'm not a grandma, but hopefully uh, it'll be about my level anyway. <laughs> and, and finally, after his summer holidays, the wing commander is back and he's left us another voicemail. Commander, Sir Arthur Curmudgeon here, dear Lug Radio. I tuned in to your much-anticipated podcast, thinking, how spiffing, a new comedy show. It began very well with a spoof of the Monty Python classic sketch, Is This the Right Room for an Argument? But things quickly broke down into walkers shouting somewhere between jackass and that dirty Sanchez, which I am told is a Mexican soap opera with lots of gratuitous swearing. It simply won't do. 
This is not what we British find funny. And I was so incensed, I almost wrote a letter to the Daily Telegraph. Then I remembered I'm banned from their pages for being too right-wing. Ah, clearly, the housemasters at your school failed to instill any sort of etiquette and decorum in you lot of mother You wouldn't catch us using that sort of language in the RAF. Yours disgustedly, the WC. Uh. Yeah, it's a shame. Matt's not on still. Yes. Well, I'm still gutted that he didn't turn up to our camp. <laughs> well, he did. Oh, well, maybe. Incognito. Yeah, Incognito. Yeah, so I didn't see a man with a, you know, a, a flying, <laughs> yeah. a flying scarf, scarf goggles, yeah. horizontally out from his neck. That, no, that yeah. was hilarious. disappointing. And Angus yeah. Dean didn't come along either. But I can confirm he was there. And that's all your feedback. <laughs> And that's all for this episode. Thank you for listening. And you can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail, numbers and Twitter feeds, Facebook and IRC channels. Let us know what you think of the show or give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. And join us on Tuesday, the 13th of September for our next live episode. Yes, thank you very much indeed for coming along tonight, Andy. It's been great to see you again. Thank you very much for having me again. I hope we haven't given you any more communicable diseases. <laughs> <laughs> Not this time. <laughs> yeah, well, there's always next time. Just a cup of tea. Yeah, sorry, nice cup of tea. So join us in a couple of weeks. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening and downloading. We'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.